Well, you know, it may seem like it's hard to follow up uh, the children's ministry, but actually it's easier. Because an awareness of how precious the Lord is, is fresh on all of our minds. You know, uh, sometimes you come up to speak somewhere and you're starting from minus zero. Somehow the songs didn't seem to hit the pace and people seem pretty dead when you get started. And hopefully along the way things liven up. But when you have uh, precious children and they're singing and there's a whisper in the glory and a tear in every eye, it's a lot easier to get started from here. Well, I have enjoyed being here again. Glad the high school can be in here tonight and that everybody has a copy of this book on prayer now. That's, that's very good. And we want to uh, look tonight at John the Baptist as a picture of a link to the coming of the Lord. And we want to turn to Malachi and see uh, the, the prediction about his preparations in coming in chapter 3 in, in, in a section. And uh, so let's turn there. Malachi chapter 3. Right at the end of the Old Covenant, this prophet prophesying before a time of discipline, a time of silence, a time where, of course, the Lord was still with his people through hundreds of years. But there wasn't a kingdom prophecy going forth but rather just a kind of an existence. And so uh, Malachi says in chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then as the dialogue continues, we come to a section beginning in verse 16. And here we see the uh, sort of corporate gathering of hidden ones there in the days of Malachi. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord listened and heard. So a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my treasure, my jewels. I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. With the statutes and judgments, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. And then we want to turn to Luke chapter 3, where we see John the Baptist coming now into his time of public ministry, declaring the way of the Lord. Luke chapter 3, beginning verse 1. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, 
Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Ituria and the region of Trachonitis, and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill brought low. And the crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then uh, just verse 15. Now as the people were in expectation. That's good enough. Our Father, we come to you. We've had this theme before us all week long. We've had the promise, the word of promise of your soon coming. You have said it in your word. We believe it. And we ask that you would make this word alive in our hearts as we come to the end of this age. But Lord, we want to know how to live in the end, how to be pleasing unto you as servants unto you. We thank you for the messengers who have come this week, for the children who have sung, for those who have taken part in burden and prayer for this whole time. Indeed, Lord, we do pray about that link. We don't know from what generation the link will be found, how many, how few, who they are, but we do believe that there will be those who will be so attractive to the bridegroom that he can wait no longer, and the heavens will open, and he will return. In any case, Lord, as we have been together in these days, we ask you now one more time for a refreshing, a uh, rekindling of the Holy Spirit within us, a new strength, a new awareness, a deeper insight into your precious word. Thank you, Lord, for this time together as we commit it into your hands. In Jesus' precious name. The king is coming soon for his kingdom. The gospel is being broadcast all over the earth. There are signs that we can see around us. And even in Israel, the fig tree is getting ripe. Things are uh, winding up or winding down. I don't know which way you put it. But there's a final moment when there is a link not an event, but a people prepared, ready for the Lord's coming. And at that moment, we will see the age of grace turn into the kingdom age. We have as an illustration John the Baptist, who is a link between the age of the law and the age of grace. Here we see him. He actually bridges, as it were, the old covenant and the new covenant. The last word spoken in the old covenant of his coming and you open up, especially the Gospel of Mark, and there's John again at the beginning of a new transition, a new age. So John is indeed a link. And uh, if you look in uh, Luke chapter 1, we just want to see that in verse 80, that the child, this is John, grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. There came a day in John's life after 30 years, basically as a hidden one, where he came out 
and spoke up and shattered the silence with the word of God. And the ground began to shake, as it were, as he began to manifest himself. As it says there in verse 80, the child grew strong in spirit. And we see he prophesied in chapter 1 and verse 17, the angel speaking and saying that John will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And so John is likened to Elijah. And you remember what Elijah was like. He was some kind of a stern character. He stood up to Ahab. Well, he couldn't quite stand up to Jezebel. He stood up to Ahab, and he stood up to the people of God, and he said, now choose today whom you'll serve. And showed by a great sign that Jehovah was the living God. The people bowed down. Uh, and Elijah looked fierce. He was wearing fierce clothes. And uh, John the Baptist came out of the wilderness wearing fierce clothes. They were uh, fearsome. They had eyes, I'm sure, that penetrated. They looked down into your soul. You just look in John's eyes and you're ready to repent. Because he can see down into your soul. When somebody came down to the waters and tried to snooker their way in, he'd say, hey, you viper. You're not ready for this. Now you produce fruits and show that you're serious, and then I'll think about it. There was no getting past that sternness of character. He was indeed in the spirit and power of Elijah. He thundered. (laughs) And so later on, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 11, if you'll turn there, as he's talking about John, who's now in prison, and uh, some messengers came from John. We won't go into all of that. But if you'll just notice in chapter 11, um, after the messengers leave, it says in verse 7, our Lord Jesus talks about John for just a second. As the messengers departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Jesus describes this man. Now, again, we have to understand the context here. People came out from Jerusalem. It was a religious capital of of the Jews. And these people, to travel down into the wilderness where John was baptizing, it was quite a journey. This was no picnic. You didn't take your car and go down there for the afternoon. So what did you go down there to see? Some reed blowing in the wind, some changeable, soft, some rhetorician who could take either side of an argument or change from one day to the next? No. No, when you went down, you saw somebody straight as an arrow. What did you go to see? Somebody in soft raiment? Did you go see one of those big royal shows, the changing of the guards and all the... Is that what you went down and spent two days going down into the rough wilderness to see this guy? No, no, no. You went down there because when you met John, you met God. Tremendous ministry he had. But as we know, he had a hidden life. And for 30 years, only a few people knew about his existence. And so we want to just mention, as we did last time, last time, I, I'm, I, the high school wasn't here, last time we spoke from Luke chapter 1 and 2, and we looked at some of the people in John's life that he grew up with, the Zechariah, Elizabeth, and Anna, and uh, Simeon, and Mary, and, and those, those hidden people there in the Judean hills. 
who were awaiting the consolation of Israel, who were righteous and pious and especially simple people. And God visited these people in a wonderful way and prepared their hearts. And this was, as it were, the womb in which John was raised up. And so uh, we see, and we need to learn the lesson, and that was what I, we tried to share last time, is this. That even today, although there's uh, big cities like New York and such like, the Lord's eyes run to and fro across the earth, looking to show himself strong to those who have a devoted heart who are pure and loyal to the Lord. The Lord is aware of these hidden ones that are all over this world. We, we don't know most of them. But they're faithful, they're pious, they're simple, they're righteous, they're waiting for the coming of the Lord. They're faithful. And one day these hidden ones who fear the Lord and speak with one another whose names are written down in that book of remembrance, one day they will shine and the sun of righteousness will bring healing and, uh, and uh, exalt these ones who have been faithful and hidden all of these lives. So I, I believe that last time what we tried to share is this. The vessel that the Lord is looking for to come back is a bride who's prepared, who in her heart is full of devotion and love. Not necessarily a big shot, but simply devoted to Jesus. And before we leave this subject and talk about John himself, who I'm going to try to say is the public side of this servant that the Lord is looking for. We looked at these little hidden ones, and I want to speak just a moment to the young people who are here. I want to give you a little exhortation, if it were, as it were, especially those of you who may fellowship in one of those assemblies of the hidden ones. Uh, today, there is uh, in, in the Christian things a, a whole new phenomenon, this sort of, these sort of Christian mega theme parks that are especially tailored for young people. By that I mean these kinds of works and churches and these large groups, they have fancy cool names. They've got a cool band. They've got lighting. They've even got football stars, celebrities who speak, intellectuals, profound thinkers, exciting times, multimedia flashing in the background. Look at our multimedia here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's very enticing to young people. I was recently in San Diego, and I was actually, my wife and I were staying right near this uh, actual, uh, like Coney Island, you know, it had a Ferris wheel and rides. And as I met some of the saints and talked to them, especially about the young people, you know, San Diego is the place to go if you're a Christian young person and you want to be a cool Christian young person. <laughs> it's happening. You go there and you've got your choice. There are 42 flavors. Whatever you want. Do you want the source or the rock or the meaning or the hill or the reality? I mean, they got names. You got your own choice, your own particular bent. You can go to large groups, small groups. They got something every night that's like free rides. Now, I know this is very tempting to go to, and I know there's a lot of young people see that, and then they see their little hidden assembly, and they begin to despise the day of small things. <laughs> well, now, I'm not against young people going for a nice blowout of worship and getting together with some other young people and throwing their arms up in the air for a few hours and saying how much they love Jesus. But you know something? You can be involved in something like that for five years and never touch the cross in your life. Never learn the lessons of loving older people or younger people. You know, the church isn't age-specific. It's a family. And how we have to learn the lessons of loving the family. I mean, uh, do you know who Tabitha is? You know, Tabitha, that little sister there in Joppa. You know where Joppa is? 
on the coast of Israel. Now, Tabitha was in a little fellowship in Joppa. I don't know if it was at Simon the Tanner's house, but if it was at the Tanner's house, it was a pretty stinky fellowship. <laughs> and probably it was a pretty small group that met in Joppa at that time. And Tabitha, I'm sure, was tempted, like all young people, to take the bus up to Jerusalem where there was Peter, James, and John, and a whole assembly out in Solomon's porch, thousands of people meeting house to house. Things happening in Jerusalem. What's happening in Joppa? There's no billboards up. There's no rock band in Joppa. But Tabitha made shawls for the old ladies and did various good works among her little family. And boy, I tell you what, they missed her when she suddenly died. But she experienced resurrection life because Peter brought her back to life, or the Lord did. And she also got to meet Peter firsthand and shake his hand. Well, uh, Peter lifted her up. <laughs> and she also happened to be the connection that led Peter there and got him involved with Cornelius and opened the door to the Gentiles to hear the gospel. Now, there's Tapitha, and she minded her own business there in Joppa, and God blessed her. And all I'm saying is, if you are, if, you, if your young people's group is you, <laughs> you are it, the young peep. There's not even a poll. <laughs> if that's where the Lord has you, the Lord will show you great and glorious things. You'll be faithful to him. And I reckon if there's a John the Baptist as some person in this last day who'll be able to stand up and be counted, that he may just come from some hidden assembly. So don't give up on the saints, those older ones around you, young ones. Don't, don't get prejudiced about worship. It's got to be with a guitar and a beat and something flashy. We sang some awfully good hymn songs tonight. They should be part of your repertoire as well. Don't, don't get impatient when the, that brother just gives you daily manna on Sunday. <laughs> now he's worked 50 hours. And instead of just watching television and drinking a beer, he studied the word, prepared a message, and he shared it. And it's, you know, it's bread and butter. It's your manna. Don't despise that because, you know, somebody has got a flashy message over somewhere else. You need daily manna. I mean, ice cream's good once in a while. But I've had ice cream about every night over here in the cafeteria. <laughs> I, I, I can't wait to get out of here. I just can't <laughs> take any more ice cream. <laughs> just a word to you dear ones who live among the hidden ones. God knows your name. Got you written down in the book of remembrance if you're being faithful. So just with that in mind, let's go on look at uh, John a little bit. John was raised up for public testimony. What a tremendous testimony he had. But he was raised up in the secret place. We see there in Luke, if you go back there in chapter 1, I just want to touch on a few things that are obvious, but as we're looking at a picture of a vessel that the Lord would be pleased to uh, come and receive to himself, we see that uh, John, in his background, in verse chapter 1 of Luke and verse 15, we see that John was a Nazarite set apart as a vow. His parents kept him from wine and the razor and kept him separate and holy. That's part of the training of a vessel, a Nazarite, separated unto God. Of course, we also know that the, uh, G, uh, John was uh, from a priestly family. His heritage was actually as a priest. He could have gone into the priesthood he went and did the apprenticing and all that's involved. We can only imagine that the, his father, as long as his father lived after John was born, his father was quite old, probably took him up to Jerusalem and, and, and little John had a special place over in the corner when his dad was uh, doing various service, you know, taking di different bowls and things around, whatever his particular service at that time would be. John got to see the beauty of the temple. He heard the beauty of the worship. He saw the wonder of the feasts. It must have been wonderful. But you know, you, you know, of course, I think the thing that stayed in John's young mind as he followed his priestly father around the most 
was probably the sacrifice of the Passover night. Something struck John in an unusual way. And, and you know, according to Josephus, in the times of Jesus, when it came to the Passover and the slaughtering of those Passover lambs in Jerusalem, Josephus counted 256,500 sheep or lambs. Now, when, when it came time to sacrifice all of these lambs for the Passover feast of all those more than 2 million who would flood Jerusalem for those seasons, all the priests were called on duty. You know, there was no policeman on vacation during that time. All of the priests were in. All of them had on their uh, smocks. All of them were involved in this tremendous offering. And if you're a little child, that's got to be a pretty impressive thing, don't you think? It's no wonder that John saw the Lamb of God in Jesus, and it was his focal point later on. I imagine that, uh, I can't imagine otherwise, maybe not Zechariah's, learning that he needs to be a quiet man, but certainly Elizabeth must have told John when he was a young man about uh, the prophecies involved, the miracle of his birth, his destiny, this forerunner, this one, this voice in the wilderness. They must have told him about all that when he was a kid. A voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's you, John. So stop crying and eat your food. <laughs> I'm sure he heard the stories, you know. But uh, we notice, um, uh, importantly, that when uh, his parents died, we don't know when or how old, but I imagine that maybe John uh, was a young teenager. John decided to go into the wilderness. And he stayed there until he was 30 years old. It says that, and we read that in chapter 1, verse 80. He stayed in the wilderness. He tried to find a home in the wilderness. Perhaps it was part of that destiny, a voice of one crying in the wilderness. He went to the wilderness to find out what's going on there. Now, this is a, a good lesson for us to learn and a good point for those who would be servants of the kingdom. Servants of the kingdom are prepared in the wilderness. A servant of God who speaks God's message has got to have their spiritual gymnasium, a time where God can deal with them. We notice in chapter 1, verse 15, that from John's birth he was filled with the Spirit. Now that's a tremendous advantage. And being filled with the Spirit is wonderful. But he had to be strengthened in the Spirit, in his Spirit by what he went through in those days in the wilderness. You know, our Lord Jesus, it says, when the Holy Spirit came down upon him, the Holy Spirit came upon him, but after he went in the wilderness and came back out, he came out in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a spiritual transaction that's necessary, represented perhaps by us looking at this thing, this matter of going into the wilderness. How do you become, as is predicted of him in verse chapter 1, verse 17, he would go in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, just how do you become strong in spirit? I, I can't imagine that John was anything other than a strong-souled person when he went in the wilderness. I, I mean, first of all, if you're a kid, let's say you're 15, I, not too many kids say, I'm going to go to the wilderness and live on my own. He's a strong young man. But you know, a strong soul does no good if you're going to speak and be God's voice. Something has to happen in your life. Otherwise, you're no good as a messenger to the Lord if it's just your reactions out of your soul. John had to learn how to be moved by the leading of the Spirit and not just by the response of his soul. And brothers and those who share the word of God, you'll find that you come to this place where you realize the Lord says, you know, don't just preach on Sunday based on something you saw Thursday. And you just have a reaction. You saw folks bickering, so you're going to speak on, you know, speak not one to another evil or some such thing. What does the Lord want you to say? Well, I'll tell you what my soul wants to say. Well, fine. Now, what does the Lord want you to say? You see, that, 
learning that lesson, learning to hear the Lord, learning to live out in response to your spirit rather than just reaction of your soul is going to be vital if you're going to be a voice for the Lord. And these things must be learned in the wilderness. Well, you can imagine in the wilderness, John already had learned, was learning the lesson, I must decrease. Now, where's our wilderness? I mean, does the Lord send you out into some kind of patch? Now, you know, some people are pretty strong. So, you know, Lance, he tells the story. The Lord had to send him out to Egypt. He went out in the wilderness so the Lord could teach him lessons. Well, now, how about your wilderness? Should you go live out in Egypt somewhere? No, a lot of times the wilderness is the church. An inhospitable place full of danger, wild animals. <laughs> but more specifically, the wilderness pretty much defines everything your soul doesn't like. Need, loneliness, fears, and all of those kinds of things that we spend a lot of time trying to avoid. There, there, it's almost, you, you know, it's almost a fact of life that young people cannot stand silence. Now they will go to bed with their iPod <laughs> and they'll turn the computer on before they go to the bathroom in the morning. God forbid silence or no TV on in the living room, unheard of. Ah, but you get out in the wilderness. Well, what happens in the wilderness? Well, you have to imagine what happened to John. Let's face it, first of all, he had, let's say, 15 years there. So let's say, first of all, waiting. A lot of waiting. Waiting for the Lord, praying. Hopefully he had some scrolls, perhaps from his father. He had the, the Torah. Maybe he had Isaiah, some scrolls with him. He read, he prayed, waited. Silent. Only by being yoked with the Lord sometimes in a time like that do we find rest for our souls. You know, the Lord can speak to us if we ever rest. If we're all agitated, it's awfully hard sometimes for the Lord to get through and share what he wants. So he waited and he waited. And you know, I don't know if this is a, an indication, but we have from Samuel's life uh, the stories in Samuel's life, some of which our brother shared with us, and we know one thing about Samuel. He, he was about as stubborn as John the Baptist. Now, you know, Samuel argued with God. No, 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 that's not the right one. It's this guy over here. And the Lord told him to do things that he actually disagreed with, but he did them. And in the wilderness with God, I don't know, maybe you're a very holy person, but if you don't do some wrestling and some arguing with God, and if you don't have some uh, issues, I don't think you, you know what the wilderness is. Now, of course, you know that the speakers who come here and speak at the conference are completely different. We live in an ideal world. <laughs> in the bliss of silence with no problems around, and the Lord just speaks to us and sends angels down. Well, you know better than that. If you want to be a servant of God, you've got a good wrestling match on your hands, and it's in your soul, and God deals with you. He wrestles with you, and he talks to you, and you disagree with him, and you, you get upset about it, and you have to go back and rethink it and then do it. In the wilderness. You know what the wilderness is. It, I, I say it's uh, maybe that small little church or that fellowship you're in, but, you know, it's where you get dealt with. It's the cross on your life. It's those things that uh, touch your flesh, wherever it's at. I don't know. We, we don't know where, where John's weakness was, but, you know, it could be that uh, loneliness was a big issue that had to be faced and conquered. It could be that fear was. It could be the insecurity. You know, it's not like everybody just believes in Jehovah Jireh. And so sometimes you have to go through some hunger and some thirst before you discover Jehovah Jireh. And, and for some people, it's awfully hard to be content 
But somewhere, John learned how to be content with uh, the camel's hair and a very simple diet and uh, a stone for a pillow. But you know, God's servants sometimes get put in strange places. And if your idea of uh, serving God is traveling around amidst the Marriott Marquis, uh, you might find that the Lord says, you know, I don't think you need all of that. Now, how can we serve the Lord if we're laden down with all of these soulish issues? So many of God's servants just have so many issues that the Lord just can't say, go. You say, well, I can't go. What if I break out in warts? What will happen? <laughs> you know... Sometimes you have to go, and it, it's a scary business. One time, I, I went to Korea one time, and I went, I remember this, this time, because uh, there was this uh, little Korean pastor who was full of faith, and we were traveling around and preaching the gospel together. I mean, I was preaching, he was interpreting, or maybe he was preaching, I couldn't tell. <laughs> anyway. We got through after one session, and he said, now we want to go to this woman's house. I just got a note, and she, she has typhoid fever. And she's been in her house and quarantined, everything, but uh, we want to go share the gospel with her. I said, oh, boy. <laughs> All right, do I have typhoid fever shots? <laughs> of course I didn't. He, and so I said, well, are you sure we should go? He said, listen, when we go with the gospel, you don't have to worry, you don't have to worry about the devil making you sick. He needs to worry about us and what we're going to do when we get in there. Well, I said, well, okay, you first. <laughs> but you know, I, I was willing to go with this guy. I mean, he was so brave for such a short guy. I tell you, we went into this house. There was darkness in the house, a terrible odor in this house, the whole thing. And we just said, in Jesus' name, we lift this thing off this place. The place lit up. We preached the gospel to this lady, and the guy prayed with her, and she got, got saved. And we left the house, and I saw the guy three days later, and I, I had to ask him. And I, well, what's the story? He said, oh, she's healed. She came down to church. She wants to be baptized. You know, you have to learn that lesson by experience. If you're afraid of every possible disease or anything that may befall you, there's a lot of issues there. Can the Lord tell you go? So there's a wilderness, isn't there? You want to be a servant of God? Welcome to the wilderness. What we learn is it's not our way, it's the Lord's way. We, and that's why we spend a lot of time waiting, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is We've got to find our voice. See, he was a voice in the wilderness. Okay, now he's in the wilderness. Where's the voice? He needed to learn to hear the Lord. And uh, this is something that uh, takes a while. We hear wrong sometimes. We, we have our impressions of things. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes We have to wait. Uh, and we're waiting for that voice. Now we could see that John... And, and, of course, this is a principle, you know. When the Lord deals with your soul, your flesh, then you're able to see into the souls of other people. Now, we can see from John's ministry, he could look right into a person's soul. He could see a sinner coming. He could see a brood of vipers. And he could see Jesus just by looking in that soul. Have you been dealt with in such a way that you can look and you can see what's in that person's life? Okay, now you see that. Now what do you do? And John had to wait. Now what do you do? What do you say? How do you bring a person to repentance? You offend them? You just speak up? What's the voice? How do you do that, you see? And John, and John had to learn his voice, you know. Uh, he respected his dad and the priesthood and everything, but it turned out that the priestly voice wasn't his voice. He never went in there and uh, took the apprenticeship toward that kind of thing. Some people think that he went into the wilderness, and what it really means is that he went into the Essene community. You know about this 
community of people who separated themselves and lived out by the Dead Sea, and they found the scrolls. This Essene community that baptized themselves almost daily and spoke about holiness and a whole lot of things. Some people speculate that John went out into that community as he was growing up and spent some time in the wilderness with them. Well, whether he did or not, there's no evidence one way or the other. But I do know one thing. He discovered that wasn't his voice. His life wasn't to be isolated from people. He was to be a voice to speak to people. So he knew isolation wasn't for him. And neither was being in the scene his voice. And you know, uh, if you turn to uh, uh, John 1, I think it especially, since John gives us a sort of an eyewitness uh, view of this, since he was a disciple of John the Baptist. In John chapter 1, when we see uh, uh, John the Baptist come on the scene, in verse 19, just read a couple of uh, five verses here. John chapter 1, verse 19. Now this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Now maybe some of those priests knew him from his childhood days. You know? And he confessed, he didn't deny, he confessed, I'm not the Christ. Well, then they said, well, wh what are you, Elijah? He said, no. Are you the prophet? No. Uh, now all that to say, of course, then he goes on and says, he's the voice crying in the wilderness. Now, you, you know, I, I don't know if you realize this, but even by the time of Jesus, there were so many false Christs around, so many so-called Elijahs. You know, a guy would come in town, a town, they probably had a, a little store where you could buy a camel's hair suit <laughs> and uh, claim to be Elijah. There were false prophets all over the place, or claim to be the prophet, the one Moses predicted, who would, uh, one would come after. Yeah. Uh, they, some would be a Jeremiah, and Lance knows they're still in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, there's Elijahs in Jerusalem right now who claim to be Elijah. You see, some claim to be the two witnesses. Uh, how many pairs of witnesses do we have now in the truth? <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, they, 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 you know, we just there's a city full of pretenders. Now, was John going to be a pretender? Who are you, Elijah? Yeah, yeah, that's me. No, no. No, no, you see, he wasn't interested in position. Oh, what a temptation. People say, what, what are you? What are you, an apostle? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not Elijah. No, 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 I'm not the Messiah. No, I'm not the prophet. Who are you? I've come with a burden. I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. Now there, that, that, you see... So he was learning who he was. Now the wonderful thing is when we turn to uh, Luke chapter 3, we see here something just really wonderful when you think about it. He found his voice. And it's so important that it's actually marked and dated by Luke redundantly in verse, chapter 3, verse 1, 15th year, Tiberius, Pontius Pilate here, Herod there, Philip there, Trachonitis, Lysanias, Annas, Caiaphas, and all of that time, it gets to verse 2. Here's the important part. The word of God came to John in the wilderness. Ah, now I know. I know. I've got the word. I've got the burden. I've got the promise. And from that time on, he became the voice. He spoke. You know, everyone who's a servant of the Lord finds a unique voice. I don't know if you've noticed, but down through the centuries, when you look at church history, at men who were epic-changing links to recovery and awakenings, they were quite unique individuals. Very human. You can't read. And, and you know, the gospel writers make sure that we understand that uh, John the Baptist was a very human guy. But he was a very human man under a very divine burden. And when he spoke with his human voice, the throne in heaven ratified everything he said. He spoke. God confirmed. He said, repent, and God brought conviction into people's lives. That's what anointing is. 
he spoke, God ratified. There's a wonderful verse in the, in, in the story of Samuel there in the, near the end, I think, of chapter 3, where when Samuel began to see God and began to speak and prophesy, it says, and God let none of his words fall to the ground. Little Samuel, and he was speaking, and, and God right, stood with him. Samuel spoke, God stood with him. And what he said, God ratified. And John came out of the wilderness with a voice, and God stood with him. And so when John spoke, it shook the silence of Israel. It shook people awake. Suddenly they were hearing nothing other than God themselves. And when he said, repent, they repented. And the multitudes came out. Because, it, you know, I mean, what was it really? I mean, what is the, uh, the essence of John's message? You say, well, it was baptism. Or it was repentance. True, true. It was speaking of one who was to come. True. But what was it, what was it that made him the voice in the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord? What was it? It's because, really, when you get down to it, when John the Baptist shared, he cleared off all the clutter that had accumulated about what it means to be the kingdom of God. Now, here he was in the kingdom of Israel. But was it a kingdom of Israel? It was actually a province of Rome. And who was the king on the throne anyway but a, a pretender and a, and a corrupt king, not an anointed king. And this wasn't even really a kingdom. But all of the rituals and all of the uh, teachings and all of the traditions had obscured a basic foundational reality. And when John came and spoke, he said, God is your king. And you're not ready. He's sending his Messiah. And you need to repent. And the people were shocked out of sleep. And awoke. Jumped into that water. And waited for a real kingdom. What a tremendous impact this man had in the one year of his ministry approximately before he was killed. Just one year. Burned like a bright light. Jesus said he was a burning lamp. Speaking the truth. Bringing the kingdom tangibly before him. And so we read in Luke chapter 3 verse 15. When he spoke there was an expectation of the kingdom. Suddenly it all cleared out. What was his ministry after all? It was a preparer of the way. He brushed off the doorway. As it says in Malachi, and he will come and prepare the way. And then the Lord will come into his temple and purify the sons of Levi. But somebody had to open the door and brush off the foundation. We see it fulfilled in Jesus' ministry. I mean, after John brought, it, brought this message of his coming, then Jesus came and went into the temple and cleansed the temple. Now this ministry of, uh, of, of this Elijah... And John the Baptist, I think in the end it has something to do with Israel, by the way. But uh, just using this as an illustration, we see that he was one who was cleaning off and uh, fixing things up. You remember uh, later on, uh, as Jesus came into Jerusalem the week before he went to the cross, the week that he went to the cross, and at one point some... Uh, the chief priests and some elders came to him and said, by any way, Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? Now, who gave you this authority? Jesus just said, let me ask you a question. If you answer my question, I'll answer yours. And all he said was this. John's baptism, heaven or man? And his arguers were silenced. Everybody knew that John's voice his baptism, his ministry was from heaven. So Jesus says, so what did you come out to hear? Just a speaker? Just a novelty? Just some kind of a show? Did you come out to the wilderness to see a parade? No, you came out because you heard something. What did you hear? Repent. 
and Jesus came in as the king. Well, I, I just share these things um, because I believe today it has, could I make an application of this anyway? I believe servants of God have a ministry today, even in these last days. And just as John spoke to Israel, I think that part of our ministry is speaking to the church, awakening the church. How? The church has gotten so encrusted with so much stuff that we don't know how to define what is church anymore. Now, of course, I'm speaking to the choir here. <laughs> and we don't know what the church is. People don't know what membership means. Uh, people have an idea of ministry that's not at all as described in the New Testament. There's been just layers and layers of human traditions and interpretations and ways that have been thrown on top of the church. And so, you know, when somebody comes in as a servant of the Lord in the last day, I believe the main burden he needs to do is to clear the foundation so people can see Jesus in the church. We can call him head, everybody calls him head of his church. Everybody calls him the foundation of the church. But so much other stuff's been added onto it, sometimes you can't tell in these, all these wings and additions that have been made where the church really is. It's people. But we need to be able to see and clarify this foundation that's gotten so covered up. The church is Jesus Christ, you know. I remember... You know, I, most of you know, I was a pastor in a church many years ago, and I came to my first conference, and I'll never forget. Uh, That's the first time I ever heard it. Now, you know, I went to college, a good Baptist college. I studied religion. I went to cemetery, went four years, got my degree. They screwed a halo on my head. And I was serving as a pastor, and Lance said, for the first time I ever heard, the church is Christ. First time. Now, see, all of you know what that means. But I don't, I don't know if you th throw a stone beyond this, the walls of this auditorium, how many more people know what that means. How cluttered things have gotten. Our testimony needs to be on a clear foundation of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ's center and circumference. What a wonderful way Lance has of putting that, you know, center and circumference. I mean, that's the church. This organic body we've been baptized into and the whole way the body works is so different than the way the church organization's working. All of that clutter, all of that clutter. The Lord's looking for some prepared people who are, just, who are simple, who are standing in Jesus Christ and Christ is in them. And they're understanding the shared life we have together in Christ, through Christ, with Christ, in the power of Christ. I remember the second time I, I went to Russia and I was teaching in this Bible school. And I, I, and I talked about this Christ in you thing. And I just shared some simple things on it. And afterwards, a, a number of people in the back of this classroom were just crying. Because they were going out to serve God and preach the gospel. They were great young people. But they'd never heard that Christ is their life. They'd never heard that. And they were just weeping for joy. I don't think in this last day what we need is apostles or prophets or anything like that so-called. That is just positions. We need the functions. But what we need is a voice that cries out in a wilderness of the church and says, here is the Lord. This is the church. This is the kingdom. And here again is a whole other subject which we can't go into tonight. There's so many Christians have no idea what we're talking about when we say that we're in the church and we're in the kingdom, but there is a difference. And we need to share these things. The gospel of the kingdom of God needs to be preached in all the world. 
as a testimony to the nations, and then the end will come. Oh, to know the kingdom, to be servants of the kingdom, to have all of this clutter clarified so that people can see. And so uh, th this is our problem. You see, if we go and share this thing, the church is Christ, and we're not living in it. We, we don't, there's no testimony of that. We're, we're, just, we're just getting together with a couple of Christians for an hour or two a week, and there's no body life and no shared Christ together. If we have no testimony, well, if we share this word, that voice has no ratification. And that's where you and I are up against it, unless we're willing to go through our wilderness and learn the lessons of body life and the reality of the church. So we, if somebody says, well, what are you talking about? We can actually say, come and see. Rather than, well, uh, don't come to our place. I think down in Richmond you should go, you know. No, so. no, 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 no. Are we working it out where we live? Are we a reality? Is there spiritual reality there? See, that's what the wilderness does. It brings us out of a lot of soulish baggage into a spiritual reality, which is so simple. That's why John's gospel is so precious for the church. It's all about spiritual reality. If he is in our bread and if he is in our light and if he is in our resurrection, uh, then whatever we're calling ourselves, it isn't the reality that's necessary for the church to be perfected. So uh, there we are. There, there is the first part about it, and then there's just one other thing I'd like to say. Not only did John speak as a voice and just say, this is the kingdom of God, and suddenly the kingdom was alive to them, but he, actually the transition moment, the moment of actual linkage, was when he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The day before he'd baptized Jesus, not knowing exactly who he was, but when the Spirit came down and rested upon him, then he knew. And the next day when he came by, John says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And suddenly it, it, the Lord of heaven was linked to us. <laughs> Take away the sin of the world. Now, now it's more than just Israel, isn't it? The Lamb of God died on behalf of all of us. This was John's voice speaking out his highest message. And so the link was made. And we could know what it means to be saved because of the Lamb of God. I, I, uh, so there's gospel right there. And, you know, of course, this was, uh, I would suppose, John's highest moment of ministry when he made that statement, behold the Lamb of God. Because right after that, probably his best disciples left him. We know John and some others left him and started following Jesus. And John's ministry kind of went down. And Jesus' ministry went up. Next thing you know, Jesus and his folks are baptizing more people than John's, and John's disciples are a little jealous. John wasn't jealous, was he? No, because he said, you know, it, it, it's my time. It's my time to decrease. But the one who I said I'm not worthy to untie his sandals, he's shown up, and I'm his friend. I'm a friend of the bridegroom. And probably within a year of that time, he, he died. He was beheaded a friend of the bridegroom. So John's voice was both uh, to the kingdom of God and to Israel uh, as he woke them up to the reality of the kingdom and the soon coming Messiah and also to the world he spoke this revelation of who Jesus was, the Lamb of God. So I would like to end by suggesting that also we as assemblies, as the church in the last days, you know, we need to preach the gospel. I, I think that if we are to be, uh, even the hidden ones, even a small assembly, I st still think we need to be willing to go out and preach the gospel. You know, there's still some people who are hungry and in darkness. There's still some people who are looking for a savior. And until the day that Jesus comes back, should we just have stopped this whole business? I think sometimes part of the problem with the reality in our fellowship life is because we're not witnessing. We're moving out beyond ourselves. You know, we can gather together and have a great rah-rah session, 
but not prove what kind of faith we really have. But when you go outside the walls and you start to speaking of Jesus in hostile territory, you find out the reality of the Lord's ratification. The Lord still wants to bring people to the Lord. That gospel of the kingdom includes the gospel of salvation. And I don't think we should just leave it to big uh, gospel organizations. Now the Lord is doing a wonderful work gathering people in. During this time we've been speaking here, uh, some 6,000 people have been saved according to the recent figures on how many people are getting saved around the world. It's a tremendous thing. And it's wonderful to hear news of how the Lord's breaking out in initiatives. You know, uh, recently, well, last six months, you know, some Romanians came by. Maybe they came to where you were. They stopped in a number of places, came through New York. And they told us this wonderful story. The Romanians meet in a group and, well, whatever the case is, you know, God has decided in Romania to start saving gypsies. Kind of like a whole new open door. And so their young people have been going down to the gypsy villages where the parents say, no, 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 don't, don't go down there. But the uh, young people are going down to these gypsy villages and the gypsies are getting saved as fast as they can preach. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? And then last year when I went back to Russia, you know, the door is kind of closing in Russia. At least that huge in-gathering that we saw uh, this season is uh, sort of winding down. But it's interesting Southern Russia is opening up with the gospel to the Muslims. You know, the whole of Southern Russia is nominal Muslims, Sunni nominal Muslims who don't know much about anything. The church has gone down there and they find a ripe field and people are being saved. Well, I thank God for such people who are willing to go into these territories and preach the gospel. Isn't it amazing that Muslims are being saved? You know, you've heard the stories, the dreams, miracles, all kinds of things. Uh, the Muslims are really getting upset. You know, the, the leaders, they don't know what to do about this. But the Lord has decided to put his finger right there. Now, where we live, you, maybe where you live is tougher than New York. But it isn't easy to go out and preach the gospel in New York. But uh, we, we go out with a little band, and we try. We hand out tracts and try to talk and preach and sing because we believe it's important for our own sakes, to be willing to lay down our fears and trust the Lord and go out. I think that's part of our testimony. Even as John spoke of the Lamb of God, so we should speak of the Lamb of God as God's people. Well, we know one thing. Because of His patience, if for no other way, God loves His people. He loves us. He's waiting so patiently. Wants us to be perfected. Wants us to be faithful. Wants to do that hidden work in the wilderness so that we can learn how to be those of the spirit and not of the flesh. Train us and teach us how to speak the gospel, speak the word of God. It's a wonderful day we live in. It's things near the end. But it's now for us to be that faithful vessel where the Lord can say, I'm ready to take the link. Faithful, little ones, faithful, serving God. Hidden life, public life, whatever the Lord wants. I don't say that you should go out and do what we're doing in New York. All I'm saying is you should pray about it. Lord, how can we preach the gospel and be alive to what the Lord says, how we lead? Uh, I, uh, let's, if we could just turn to one last verse here, I'd just like to end with verse uh, in, in Mark chapter, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 24. Just a one verse of encouragement. You know, in Matthew 24, our Lord starts talking about his coming and various circumstances involved. Just verse uh, 45 and 46, actually 46. Uh, in verse 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Here it is. Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. I don't know what kind of impressive things we have to do. All I know is we need to be faithful to the Lord. We need to obey him. However, the Lord has enabled us as assemblies together, just praying for one another, helping one another, 
doing these things. May it be when the Lord comes again, he finds us so doing. Not asleep. Not saying, oh, Lord, the world's so tough out there. We're just, we, we can't share anymore. We're just waiting for you to come. But to be faithful publicly and as the Lord deals with us in, in, in the inward ways. May the Lord find us as a servant that he can say, well done. Come and receive us. Find his bride ready. Having sown all those righteousnesses of the saints into that wedding garment, now ready for the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for John. We thank you so much that we're so near the end. We thank you so much for the link that you want to form with us. We thank you so much for your love for your children. What patience you bear with all of us, for sure. Our Lord, teach us how to be faithful to you, both in our hidden life and in our public life. We may be a servant of God. Lord, did you give us that voice that could speak regarding the truth of the simplicity of devotion to Christ, of the truth of the foundation and reality of Christ as the church, that we could learn how to speak the gospel of the kingdom of God in these last days. Do help us, Lord. Do help us. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Teach us your ways. We, don't, we know we don't have it right yet, Lord, but we want to learn. Show us your ways, O oh Lord. And help us be those who prepare the way for your coming again. In Jesus' name we pray.